Today I want to look at one of those big, great questions. How do we know God exists? John says, through Him all things were made. Without Him nothing was made that has been made. Theologically, we're going to look today at three important arguments, teach you a little theology. Number one is the cosmological argument for the existence of God, and that simply is, is that God is the cause of everything in the universe, that He's the first cause of all that there is. The second argument that we'll look at is known as the teleological argument that there is an order and a beauty to our universe, and that too points to God. That's why mathematicians and physicists and biologists and chemists are are always excited when they're in their, their element because they see an order, a beauty in what they study and what they know. And then finally, we're going to look at the moral argument. Why do we know right from wrong? Why is it that we have a conscience? And that because we have a conscience and we know right and wrong, why is it that society, wherever we go on this planet, has created moral codes to live by? Well, let's begin with uh, the first related question to why God exists, and that is, is, you know, was the universe an accident? Why is there something, the universe, and not nothing? It's interesting what uh, David says. David says, the heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of His hands. Day after day they pour forth speech Night after night, they display knowledge. Now, we don't always hear the speech, and we don't always take in the knowledge because we're a little busy. I, uh, you know, a few weeks ago, we had those beautiful, clear nights, and I don't know if, if you uh, went outside and looked up, but it was pretty spectacular. The nice thing about this time of the year is you don't have to stay up till 10 or 11 to do that. You only got to stay up till 6 right? Dinner, go out and look at the stars. And it is amazing to look up. And as we do, I think as we take in the creation, the universe, all that there is, it's profound in what it says about God and God's existence. Why is there something and not nothing. The two proofs for that, one has to do with the external uh, universe, the external space, outer space. Outer space is actually quite vast. And the understanding today, the accepted norm in science is that uh, the universe came into existence at a certain time and locale. The Big Bang Theory, that now everything is rushing away from a common point. Another understanding of that has to do with the the vastness of that outer space, and outer space is very vast. When you look up at night, let me give you an example. When you look up at night, you're looking at our own galaxy, the Milky Way. How vast is the Milky Way? And that's just a small, tiny speck in all the galaxies that there are in our universe. You're looking at over 400 billion, I didn't say million, 400 billion stars in the Milky Way. 400 billion stars? You mean there might be solar systems around every one of those stars? Oh, yeah, that's pretty big. Just our own Milky Way is pretty vast in and of itself. It is between 90 and 100,000 light years in diameter. Now, let me help you with that. 
A light year is how fast light travels. It travels at a speed of 186,000 miles a second. All right, so let's do that math. 186. That's a really big number. And I didn't want to memorize it, so I didn't. It's a big number. It's vast. And that's just our own Milky Way. Outer space is very vast, so is inner space. Very vast. Outer space, you've got the origin of the universe. You have the vastness of the universe. Now, what we know about the universe is inner space. And inner space is very impressive as well. Uh, inner space is... Uh, well, let me give you an example. How, how, how vast and complex is inner space? The Hubble European Space Agency has done a lot of work on what we can see. The matter that we can see. And we can see a lot. Now, I'm not, not just talking about what we see with the naked eye. What we see with electron microscopes. What we can uh, take in from the Hubble telescope. How much of all the matter that's out there in the universe do you think we can actually see, even with the Hubble telescope, electron telescopes, how, how much do you think? Scientists estimate, cosmologists of the Hubble European Space Agency estimate that we can only see 15 to 20 percent of all matter. Wow. Only 15 to 20 percent? Yikes. Yeah, outer space is vast, inner space is vast. Why is it vast? Why is it so large? Did that happen by accident, or is that a plan? The Bible says it's a plan. David says all you have to do is look up at the stars, and they'll speak to you. And what they say is they speak about God's design about God's love, about God's plan and God's purpose. Are we an accident or are we planned? That's another good question. You know, our, our universe might be here out of just cosmic coincidence, but is it an accident or is it a plan? Well, here I just look at the probability that the universe came into existence all by itself. You know what the probability is? Hoyle, who is the scientist who coined the phrase uh, Big Bang Theory, says that, that the fact that the universe might have come into existence by accident on its own is the probability of a tornado moving through a junkyard and assembling a Boeing 747 that flies. Now notice it didn't say Airbus, he said a Boeing 747. <laughs> Let me give you another example. Take the state of Texas, cover it four feet high with silver dollars. Take one of those silver dollars and color it red. Place it somewhere in the state of Texas, somewhere in that four feet pile. The probability that the universe came into existence on its own is the same probability that you could land in the right place in the state of Texas, put your arm down somewhere into that four feet pile of silver dollars and pull out the one colored red. Gee. That doesn't sound like probability to me at all. That sounds like an impossibility to me. What is far more convincing, if we want to know about the origin of the universe, is that cosmological argument that God is the first cause that brought everything into existence. All in our universe into existence. And the proof is outer space and inner space, the external space and the internal space of our universe.
Now let's move on to question number two. How did we come to be here? How, how are we here on this, on this planet? Are we just a cosmic coincidence? Now let's go to Acts. From one man, he made every nation of men, that they should inhabit the whole earth, and he determined the time set for them in the exact place where they should live. Luke's recording the reality that there is an order to things. It's the teleological argument. How do you, how do you know the teleological argument is true? Well, one is, is the, the orbit of the planets. And I don't know if you read much in this area, and, and I don't do a lot of science reading. And if you're a scientist and you have bigger uh, questions that need finer, more uh, technical answers, just Google a guy named Hugh Ross. Uh, and he has his own website. He's a Canadian astrophysicist, and he knows more. He's forgotten more than I'll ever know about the subject. But he's a guy to check out. One article that I read just talked about what would happen in our solar system if one planet got a little bit out of alignment. And the illustration was is it would look a lot like two boys sitting down with a bunch of cars to play together. There'd be a collision. It wouldn't be a good thing. The solar system only works because the planets stay in their orbits around the sun. And if you vary those too much, that would create a real problem. Another, uh, another issue is the, the need for the four fundamental forces in the world to stay in balance. Those fundamental forces are the speed of light, gravitational consistency, and the strength of uh, strong and weak uh, um, nuclear forces. And if those things don't stay in balance with one another, the world as we know it would not exist. How little can it vary? The estimation is that if you vary any one of those things, as little as one part per million, wow, one part per million, you alter them one part per million, you'd have a different outcome than the world that we live in, than the atmosphere that we enjoy. Maybe you could make a human being by accident. That's a possibility. But it's interesting that as we look at our atmosphere and we look at our world, how we're we're really set up for human existence. One of those things is the delicate balance that exists between the, the, the primary components of our atmosphere. Light, water, carbon, and oxygen. The same thing is true if you mess with those too much, it would alter our environment, that we, our atmosphere that we live in. Now, we often think of that in human terms. Well, isn't that just like baking a cake? Does it really matter if you put in a little bit more sugar or a little bit more flour in the outcome of the cake? And if you're baking, that's true. A little more sugar, uh, you know, a little more flour is probably not going to change things. But when you're talking about the, the balance of the atmosphere of the earth, you're talking a little bit more like the idea that what you're going to introduce is one drop of cyanide. And that poisons the whole cake, doesn't it? It changes everything because then you can't do what the cake was made for and that's to make you fat. <laughs> you can't enjoy it. We could not enjoy our atmosphere if you altered those four components by very much. Another thing that, that points us to the fact that there is a 
really a, a setup by God for us to be in existence has to do with DNA and the proteins in our, in our planet. DNA is very unique in that it's very good, uniquely good at reproducing itself. And we have just the right kinds of complex proteins around for there to be human life. There couldn't be human life if DNA didn't uh, uh, duplicate itself accurately. If there weren't the right kinds of uh, simple and complex proteins uh, in, a, in, our, in our world, on our planet. This is so true that there is a principle, the anthropic principle, that is forwarded by such scientists as Brandon Carter, who says when you look at the atmosphere and uh, the environment of planet Earth, it seems to be designed, the physics and the biology of it are designed to create human life. Uniquely so. Hmm. Are we here by accident? Or does God have a plan? It's clear that there is an order to the universe. There is an order to our galaxy. There is an order to our solar system. There is an order to our atmosphere. There is an order to our planet. And the balance of that is more fragile than most of us understand. It's more fragile than we, we want to know. But we're learning that more and more, aren't we? As we look at our planet and look at our atmosphere, we understand that, that there is a fragility to it, that there is a need for a balance of things. The third big question I want to answer today is, is why are we here? Who are, who are we? Who are we as human beings? And we're, we're human beings and, we're, and who we are is really made up of two things. First of all, we have a conscience. Why do we have a conscience? I think it's a couple of things. One, it's because we're created in the image of God. God so created man in his own image. How do I, I know that? Let's look at Genesis chapter 3. Notice, before the fall, Adam and Eve, everything was going fine. They didn't experience any guilt. They were doing what was right. Well, when they did what was wrong, what happened? Ah, then their eyes, the eyes of both of them, were opened. And they realized they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and they made coverings for themselves. They felt embarrassed. They felt guilt. Why do we feel guilt? Why do we feel embarrassed? Then in Acts, Paul says, I strive to keep my conscience clear before God and man. We want to have a clear conscience between, before one another and God. And then finally, I'm a pragmatist. I like Romans 7.15. For what I want to do, I do not do. But what I hate, I do that. I know what I want to do, but then I know what I don't want to do, and I do that. That makes me feel guilty. I hate that. I don't like that. I don't like that about myself. We don't like that about ourselves. Philosopher and theologian Kant says that there is a moral law within us. And the question is, is why do we have that moral law? How do we know we have a moral law within us, a conscience that knows right and wrong, Timothy Keller points to the fact that when we're preparing or readying ourselves to do something that we know is wrong, we restrain ourselves. Why do you restrain yourself from doing what is wrong? And the answer simply is, is because you have a conscience. You have a conscience. That we know what is right and what is wrong, and we create moral codes to live by driven by the sense that inside of us there is a, a, a moral, a, a, a conscience, a moral code within us. And where did that come from? I believe it, it came from God. 
That to be created in the image of God, one of the stamps of that, one of the verifications of that, is our conscience and our understanding of right and wrong. A second thing that defines who we are on this planet is our desire for intimate connection with another human being. And as we look around our world, we realize that that is rare. And the rarity of it isn't that we are attracted to someone sexually, but the fact that we're attracted to someone uh, and, and sex is not an issue. In fact, that's really true in marriage. In marriage, there's a higher drive for intimacy that goes far beyond sex, isn't there? There better be, right? Right? And we have this drive to have intimacy with someone else. Where did that come from? You don't, you don't see that in the, uh, in the other animals on the planet. Yes, there, there is an attraction to one another out of a necessity to reproduce. But for human beings, it's beyond that. We have this drive to be connected to one another. And where did that come from? Is it simply social adaptation? That's one view. There is a necessity for human beings to be in relationship with one another. And so over time, we've developed this high level of intrinsic desire to be in relationship with one another. Another thought is it's really just biochemical reactions in our brain. Is that what it is? Is it just brains? Is it just biology? Or is our drive to be in intimate relationship with one another, does it supersede those two things? I believe it does. And the answer isn't social adaptation or chemical changes in the brain, although those two things happen. We have a relational drive because we were created by a relational God. It's in a relational God's image that we've been created. That's the moral argument. Does God exist? He does exist. Jesus Christ came to our planet and He lived just like we do. What I love philosophically is to think about the idea, can I as a finite human being, can I bridge the gap to an infinite God? And the answer is, is you can't do that. It doesn't matter how moral you are, how much you serve, how giving you are. You'll never bridge that gap between you and God because it's infinite. But I do believe and I can understand that an infinite God can choose to become finite and enter time and space, and that's exactly what the Bible says about Jesus. That Jesus was an infinite God who became finite. That Jesus Christ was total God and total man. And that's why His life, what He teaches... His death upon the cross, His last supper is important. Because Jesus is really revealing His nature and His character. He really said, you know, I'm just like you are. I'm flesh and I'm blood. And when I die on the cross, it's because I'm willingly giving myself for you. When he took the cup, he said, this is my blood shed for you. That the work, so to speak, that Jesus did upon the cross, his atoning work was on our behalf. Why would God come, die on the cross to give us a full life and eternal life? Simply because God exists. Because he created the universe. He created all that we know and all that we can't know. And He did it all for us because we're created in His image. When you look up the next time at night, realize that's God's gift to you. 
He created all of that beauty just so that you would know He existed. And that above all that He created, you are supreme. That He loves you far more than the stars and the galaxies and the solar systems and even the delicate balance of light and water, carbon and oxygen in our atmosphere. I can't think of a more personal and profound way to express it than in this meal. As we share the bread and the cup together, share these words, this is Christ's body broken for you and this is Christ's blood shed for you. Take the bread individually because we all, we all need to receive the great gift that God has for us in Jesus Christ personally. That's part of His plan. I'd ask you to hold the cup because we take that together here uh, because God does have a plan in this big vast universe for us together as well. Let us continue to worship God.